What's going on everyone? Welcome back to a very special video of our Ramblings of a Sikh. As I'm getting set up, let me introduce you to our location today, Hampton Court Palace. It's here that everything started. In the aftermath of World War I, around 1800 members of the Indian Army made their temporary home here, marking their involvement in the post-war peace celebrations. This notable chapter from the past is being rekindled right where it unfolded through the exhibition, The Indian Army at the Palace. The exhibition explores the soldiers' living conditions and personal journeys while also shining a light on the wider social-political context of the time. Through a rich array of never-before-seen artefacts, photographs and personal narratives, the exhibition provides a window into the past and to appreciate the indelible imprint they left on the historical record of Hampton Court Palace. Now, I'm here today to record a super exciting behind-the-scenes video of the exhibition covering each part of it, diving into the stories of some of the artefacts and getting to know more about what it took to put something like this together. Level 2 YouTube members or higher, you should have instant access to it now. Everyone else, you'll get to watch that in the next couple of weeks, so make sure to subscribe as not to miss out. However, today I'm joined by Rao Singh and Tej Singh, two of the organisers behind this exhibition, who will help guide us through these stories, further providing a tantalising insight into the exhibition that will hopefully interest and intrigue you enough to go to Hampton Court Palace to experience it yourself. What I want to start with for this exhibition is why is Hampton Court Palace so important as a location for where these people were resting or situated? So Hampton Court is a site for Sikh history. So it's a quite an interesting one because Hampton Court is what's termed a historic royal palace. Okay. So it's historic in that there's no royal family that lived there today. It's not oh, a resident. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's a historic palace. You know, so Hampton Court is associated largely all the visitors, anyone who goes there, it's because it's a Tudor palace built in 1515, all right? So, and when we look from a Sikh perspective, Guru Nanak was on the Tafti at 1515. Yeah, yeah. The Yatras around the, around the world, you know, and the Odassis. Um, so 1515, so the palace is as old as Sikhi. You know, Sikhi was probably just 15 years young at that time. And you said Tudors. Uh, Tudors. Like, so which king King or Henry VIII. Built it. King Henry VIII didn't build it. So his cardinal, it was the residence of his cardinal. Then obviously he had a falling out with his cardinal. Yeah. The cardinal moves on and he takes over the palace. Fine, okay. Yeah. So, so that, from Henry VIII's time. Henry VIII's time. So every every visitor comes to Hampton Court because of King Henry VIII. It's about banquets, kitchens, parties, the palace. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's on the River Thames, boats, etc. And literally, it was probably four years ago that Ted has been telling me about Hampton Court Palace. But we've been working on the tours together. And Ted just said to me, Rab, there is a lot of history around Hampton. So really that history started with Sophia for me. You know, Sophia, the lead Singh had a grace and favour apartment at Hampton Court Palace. And you say grace and favour, what does that mean? So her father's passed away, the Leap Singh's passed away. She's a godchild of Queen Victoria. Queen Victoria then gives her a grace and favour apartment on the estate for her London residence. So she did spend a lot of time, all of her London um, resident that's her flat and i'm assuming this is before she becomes like she's heavily involved in being a suffragette or is this a, like during the suffragette time so, so hold they... on so hold on hold on hold on hold on. you can't we can't skip over a fact like that so you're telling me she's a suffragette at the same time she's living in a, a, a building that is essentially given to her by the queen exactly and that's why she was such a prominent suffragette because of her royal family connection so i think she was like weaved into the suffragette movement so that it would gain popularity going media attention do you think without her royal, like without the queen's backing so to speak i know she's not literally supporting her but as in giving her a house is is a pretty decent way of supporting someone um do you think if she didn't have that she would have been as influential as a suffragette as she was as she was um, probably not in the media because okay. it, when a princess who has a great favor apartment support queen victoria died in 1901 yeah, so the yeah. so king is a king edward and, you know, he's talking to his minister saying, look, she's causing all this embarrassment to us. What can we do about her? We, but they can't kick her out of her grace and favour apartment because Queen Victoria had bestowed that upon her. You know, so there was, there's letters at the British Library, you know, about what do we do with this, this woman, this, this woman yeah, yeah, who's yeah. going yeah. around um, causing all this havoc, you know, according to the government. So that was one part of the history. And then Tej told me about all the rest of the history, which is, I'll let you carry on here, about based on the coronation camps yeah well just coming back to maybe why hampton court palace was chosen mm. uh I've come across a few articles in some newspapers originally it was going to be old deer park which is not that far it's in richmond okay. and a, a, a decision has been made um just before the 1902 camp yeah. 
that they're going to use Hampton Court, or they're going to use Home Park. Okay. Home Park, which is right next to Hampton Court Palace. Yeah. And one point, was all, it was all part of the same grounds. Oh, okay. um, and we think Hampton Court Palace was chosen for the Indian Army contingent, because there's many other colonial contingents from the West Indies or parts of Africa, Australia, New Zealand, if, for example, in Alexandra Palace yeah. or other parts of London. So Hampton Court Palace was chosen, I think, partly because it's the closest part of London, if you like, to Southampton. Yeah. So it's the first palace you come up to if you travel oh, up so from Southampton. Oh, so it's kind of like on the route, so to on speak. On the route, yeah. Secondly, they had the space in the grounds. Um, and thirdly, they had the means to get into central London quite easily. So the, you've got a train station, plus you've got on the, on, on the Thames. So it was quite strategically located. So it was actually picked for its practical use rather than because it was a palace per se. For such a large contingent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So as in, I guess if there was a hotel at that point that was big enough, they may have put them in that. But it's actually just the fact that you need a building that can support so many people and everything that goes with it, the food, the bedding, the rest of it. Well, you mentioned a hotel, but you've got to remember if you've got cavalry coming, you need space for the horses. Okay, good yeah, point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah Couple so horses in a hotel. Fair. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So okay. uh, yeah, because they bought everyone. You know, all, uh, all, everything came. So it wasn't with them. just physically the people. It was actually like, as in. So let me rephrase this: the soldiers that were stationed there were stationed as though they would be if they were out going to war. Then I'm guessing, like, as in they're coming it's in like there, the, the camp. full regalia and indeed, with all they, of the goods. Indeed, including um, camp followers or you could say non-combatants. So like chefs, cooks, washers. Exactly. Dobbies, Dobbies okay. Dugies, Dugies. Um, Barbers, if you, if you, yeah, if you yeah. but every And every regiment bought their own. So it wasn't just one cook for everyone. One cook per unit. One cook per <laughs> regiment. Multiple so kitchens, you got, multiple laundries. And would, I don't know if it's a segregated at this point, but would you also have different chefs for different, like halal, non-halal? Yes, you would. You would have you would. this. Yeah. Yes. Um, okay. You've, there's actually images of uh, in Urdu it's written like um, um, langar kana musulman like in Urdu like we've got it translated um, and it's like a it's like a shed where they're cooking for you know for certain certain communities. So going back to Hampton Court, then when Ted started saying to me, you know, Rab, we can create a tour around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We had Sophia's house, we had the coronation camps, we had Home Park. We knew these stories. But when we curate these tours, we kind of link them to tangible items. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. So you see this, and this is the story behind it. That's how we do our London tours. So I was kind of umming and arming, hurrying with Ted, just thinking, yeah, but it's all storytelling in locations. I can't, there's nothing can't to show prove you something. Yeah, that this yeah. is Sophia was here. The stamp then came out from the Royal Mail. So does the Creighton. building that she lived in, that she like, lived, yeah. well, does that still exist in the way it was Gee, then? Exactly, exactly, as it is. And now it's got a blue plaque on there saying Princess Sophia, the leap thing, leap And chin. so that's the building that another, what, Anita Faraday and House, yeah. yeah. Okay. And Peter Band. And is that near to Hampton Across the road. It's just across so the road. So it's part of the estate in the old days. Okay. There was a fence. Okay. And that's, at, at that fence, she came out of bed one day, she put a mink coat on given to her by Queen Victoria, sat outside, Stylish woman. <laughs> sat outside, um, well, stood outside Hampton Court Palace and sold the suffragette magazine for women's rights. And that's what memorialized on the UK stamp. That's pretty insane. Wow. Oh, and so that's what that, that photo that she's, where she's holding the- Yeah, it's right. we've located that exact so, location. So if you go into Hampton Court Palace, that's the main entrance. That she stood out and- yeah. From... yeah, they built a wall after, after. Oh, wow. It was just a fence and the estate just carried on. Into... That changes the whole kind of impact of that image because she's not just stood on a random road, right? She's stood in front of a no. royal palace and- yeah. Basically we'll saying fingers that. up to you. So yeah, right. touche. We'll show you that stamp. <laughs> That's good. And and then we have the station opposite and you see all the parades and people coming over. And it was just like, how do we tangibly do we tell that story on a group tour? You yeah, know? yeah. So four years ago, it was kind of like a vision in TIG. I was just like, mate, I, it's hard. I can't work with anything. Here. So you guys have been working on this exhibition literally for four years then? Like, then do, like the idea no, of I'll tell you, it. I'll tell you what happened about six years ago. Almost okay. to this day. Yeah. yeah, so six years, 2017. <laughs> um, I I emailed the palace. I didn't yeah. really know who to email. I just emailed a random email address. Because <laughs> uh, Aftar Barra had an image of the 23rd Sikh pioneers at Hampton Court. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I emailed them, uh, given that's the regiment of my great-grandfather. Yes. And I thought he might be in there. Because I actually didn't know how to recognize him initially. Oh, yeah, I see what um, you mean. I, and I wondered if they had the names. 
In fact, they didn't really know anything about this. They knew something about the regiment, but they didn't have the names. Um, so they invited me in and two of the chaps, one called David Packer and another guy called Ian Franklin, who are both now retired, yeah. took me to Home Park. I okay. mentioned that 23rd Sikh Pioneers were actually one of 26 regiments here in 1902. There were 1,200 Indian soldiers here. Wow. And uh, they did, while well, they didn't have the names, and I got them from the British Library anyway by then, um, that really was the beginning of, of this journey because David just said, when he just pointed out Home Park, he goes, wouldn't it be nice, Tej, if there was some kind of board here telling people that the story history and, of it yeah and we walked back casually and I, that really planted a seed in me. <laughs> i thought well actually it would be great yeah yeah because yeah. nobody here knows this no well and I'm we'd just... and we'd just finished in 2018 an interpretation board at chelsea yeah yeah at yeah the memorial so ted just got his idea of an interpretation board we've actually proved we can do it by doing oh i see and, and so it comes things together started then. To yeah, yeah, us. Yeah. so he was saying to me you know if we could do a tour we could get an interpretation board here and do the tours and I was like, yeah, okay, but you know how hard it is to talk to a palace? You know, I've been working with <laughs> Chelsea Hospital for eight years before I got an interpretation yeah, yeah. board there. Yeah. And I was just like, kind of, okay, yeah, it'd be nice, but it's hard. You know, it's the other side of London. Yep. It's a palace that's got an entry to go into, £29 yeah, yeah. Pounds to go into. And then what happened, the stars started to align because we've now sown the seed in people's heads, yeah, right? Yeah. So May 2021, I get an email. We've just revamped our website during COVID, get an email. Um, Hello, my name is Sakira. I'm working at Hampton Court Palace. We're looking to do some research into the Indian Army here. Um, do you think you can help? <laughs> you know, well, you know? funny you ask, right? Yeah, <laughs> well, yeah. funny you ask, I said. I, so I said it to Ted and I said, Ted. You're up. Yeah, so I said to Zakira straight away and a whole series of Zoom calls started. And at that time, they were talking about an exhibition called Standing with Giant. Which are those big silhouettes? Big silhouettes. Right. They're now installed again, third year running. So they needed someone to design a Sikh silhouette yeah. to represent the Indian Army because they didn't just want Tommy soldiers at Hamilton. Yeah. They wanted to show that the Indian Army well, were here as well. as well. Yeah. So I said, that's a good idea. So again, Tej and Aftara wrote to them and said, look, we, we can design a Sikh silhouette. It's not hard, <laughs> you know, for us. And that was what all the meetings were about, a Sikh silhouette. But initially, yeah. Working with them, talking to them, actually building a relationship, then showing what we had. Yeah, yeah. Then Zakira took it up and put the, put the kind of business case in for an yeah, exhibition. That's how it happened. That's insane. I don't have so, the yeah. interesting thing is, you know, we're called a little history of the yeah, Sikhs, yeah. right? We're like the 30th person you contact when you can't. <laughs> so first you go to Guru Singh Sabha here, Guru Singh yeah, Sabha yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. They, they, they wrote to everyone and no one replied by email. So literally we were the only one to reply. Oh, if wow. you were around at the time, they would have found you, but you had a start. I would have definitely passed them over to you guys. Man. <laughs> this is, that's hard on my forte. Oh. You know? So Kira did say even, you know, the, all the Gurdwaras that come up in the top 10, I think, just reply to your email every now. Yeah, yeah. Just check your inbox, <laughs> yeah, right? It might be something inbox. worthwhile. Um, there's so much I want to ask about how this exhibition got put together. But before we do that, I want to find out more about then the living conditions that these soldiers are enduring or or at least experiencing. Maybe enduring sounds a little bit negative. Um, <clears throat> but you mentioned obviously that everyone's turned up: soldiers, the horses, the washers, the barbers, like. How is the, like, so who is organizing these people to come over and how is it set up and structured and what are the living conditions like for these people? But you see, if we try and do this in each segment, the night and exit, then the night and then, because each scenario kind of differ, isn't it? The night, the seven, 1919, well, the conditions and the well, environmental factors around it. And are they at these different times all staying in Hampton Court? Well, that's a good question, actually, because I'm going to come to that that, what, that second one okay. in, in a minute. Yeah, yeah. Um, in terms of a, a good a good example would be 1919, okay. because there's a bird's eye view map of of the structure of how they set the camp up. Yeah. Um, so you would have the first thing that we have to kind of emphasize is all of the soldiers, British and Indian, were in the park because some people have come up to me and they think only the Indians were in the park and the British soldiers were inside the palace. Oh. Actually, all the soldiers, none of the soldiers were inside the palace. Okay. They were in the park, okay. including the British soldiers. So you had British officers. So every Indian regiment had a British officers. So your, your colonels, your captains, they were all British. They were, so that, that was a sector. Yeah. Next to that was the Indian officers. Yep. Then would be the Indian other ranks, which is anyone who's Indian, but not an officer. Okay. That Havildars, Nikes, Sepoys. Okay. So, and then you also had the camp followers. Yep. So they were kind of segregated like this. Right, the British officers, Indian officers, and then other ranks. Yeah. Um, 
So that's the first point to stress. Um, second thing is, as you say, with all these followers, they were taken care of. In collect- they brought their own doctors. Should be <laughs> we've, actually, we've, actually got, we've actually got five doctors, an image of five doctors. That's and insane. A mini hospital. That's yeah. actually on the bird's eye view map as well. Yeah, mini, yeah. mini hospital, which is basically just the doctors with a problem <laughs> from probably a few stretches. Um, so they had everything. They brought everything with them. They just transplanted their life. You know, washing clothes, fixing clothes with tailors. Everything was there on the grounds, which sounds very convenient, but it also meant there wasn't a need to mix with the locals, which is also yeah. what they didn't want them to do. Oh, so okay. there wasn't a need to this, do This it. brings me on to the next question in the list, which is how are these people interacting with the locals and how are the locals taking to these people? Because like even the experiences of my family in say the 70s is, and i'm sure lots of people listening to this can can relate which is there's a lot of racism usually but we're talking 1919 we're talking all over 100 years ago but equally there's a caveat to this which they're soldiers so there's a use for these people in that they are defending the empire and all of the positivity that goes with that in in the eyes of the locals but What's actually happening on the ground, and like, do they interact with locals? Well, we we here we can divide things by by the camp because okay by the year. So they were here just briefly. They were here in 1902 for Edward the Seventh coronation. Yeah. 1911 for George the Fifth. Yep. 1937 for George the Sixth, and in between for the peace parade in 1919. Yeah. yeah, yeah. The 1902 was the first time they were here. Okay. So that was a, a, a trial and an experiment for even the authorities. Everyone, yeah, yeah. And what we found out from the newspaper reports in 1911 is uh, a decision was made in 1911 that we're not going to make the mistakes that we made in 1902. Okay. So it goes on. So what happened in 1902, it was a free-for-all, right, in the camps. So members of the public could come up and start talking and interacting and even try a bit of the food, and it caused offense because of very strict caste obligations of certain of certain communities oh, okay, and okay, they were offended okay. by that so in 1911 they had this system where they had passes so actually the soldiers were the ones who were being, being offended, offended not the locals the locals that's were, right the yeah. locals were actually intrigued then to an extent they were intrigued because if they're coming over and stealing well not stealing your food but <laughs> yeah wanted right, to yeah. try a little bit like try a little bit okay so actually and it was the soldiers who were like yo you need to keep these people away from us or, or, I don't know if it's the soldiers or, or the or the, the higher people hierarchy. Okay. Um, because another, even more disturbing than that was, um, and it's reported in the newspaper. Yeah. Is a lady pulled the beard of a Sikh soldier to make sure it's real. Maybe. I mean, it doesn't say. It doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't go to say why. Okay. Um, I don't know. If they thought that they were exotic men from the east. I don't know what they thought, but and this did cause offence. As though they had never seen a beard before. But anyway, yeah, fair. Okay, yeah. weird. <laughs> Which in those days people did have, yeah, yeah, because yeah, like, there's common. always those British cartoons right. and they've got these yeah, yeah. huge yeah. mustaches and beards, right? But so, yeah, uh, and so therefore in 1911 they had a more regulated system where they to would keep be people cordoned away. off, yeah, you needed a pass to get in, um, and that was repeated in subsequent coronations. Oh, wow. yeah, I think in those early, early um arrivals, yeah. you did see them kind of like the images you see in France when the Sikhs are walking through Paris, yeah. You see them walking through Hampton and all the town have come out to, to see, see them what's and going the kids on. are looking up to the kind of their heroes, you know, and, and that's how it felt like in these images. We have them here and, and the kids have certainly got that kind of look of these and, tall yeah. super warriors coming in, you know, marching through their town and they're like little boy scouts looking up at them going, wow, you know, that's what you see in those pictures, really. It's kind of a reversal of how, how you would new assume. arrivals would be yeah, rolled up there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, because you wouldn't expect them to be on the roads being like, oh, hi, yes. how's it going, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, one question that I wanted to ask was this, in 1919, when the soldiers are stationed, it's March, if I'm correct? No, August. August. August, August. okay. So yes. this is after Jillian Wilder Bark. That's right, right. that's okay. a good point, yes. Now, I couldn't help, because I wrote an introduction for this, which was basically, and in it, it pointed out the months that they're stationed, which, as you correct me, is August. Um, which is after Julian Wallabag. Now, my first question is, how fast did information travel back then? Because obviously in today's day and age, when something like that was ha- like you know, the stuff that's going on in Palestine at the moment with the ongoing genocide, that information travels so fast because of the fact we have social media. Back then, we've got newspapers, we've got telegrams and, and information that's coming to you via boat or whatever, right? First of all, how does that 
does that information get to the Indian Army soldiers and how is it relayed to them? And then secondly, does that actually change anything in stationing these people? Or like, as in, I guess what I'm asking is, is actually, does Jalil Wala Bark have any impact on these soldiers? Well, I mean, they've come from, um, most of them have come from um, India because they've already returned to India. Most of them have. And they've returned after, after what, the First World War? After the First World War. But actually on that note, for example, uh, the first battalion of the 23rd Sikh Pioneers didn't come in 1919 because they were in the Army of the Black Sea. Oh. So not all regiments came in because they were still deployed in, say, Mesopotamia or Northwest Frontier. Most of them did come. Some of them didn't. But let's assume that majority of them have come from India. Now. Yeah. Um, they may have... I, I, I've gone the, with the assumption, which you shouldn't do, actually, is that they knew about Jalilwana Bagh. Yeah. Um, but, but it could well be that they that they haven't come directly from India maybe they've come from from Egypt yes maybe they've come from um, uh, Mesopotamia directly to the UK um, and, and therefore they, did, they didn't know about it but um, there was an assumption on my part that they've come from India but that was not okay. civil case so we were talking about the fact that they they were stationed in other parts of India so they weren't even in the Punjab when right. they were in India okay. so they knew what wasn't going to get, get to them, them. Yeah. because the British probably suppressing that news, right? Well, I think what well, that's the reason I asked because in a lot of the newspaper reports of the time that you read about Jalilwala Bagh, they're published after. They're not published after the inquiry. Yeah, they're the not inquiry. published contemporary to yeah, yeah. April thirteenth or whatever the date is, nineteen twenty-one. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and so that made me then question: if the information getting to the public takes so long, surely getting to the Indian Army is even going to take even longer. It does feel like that. However, like at the same thing. time, we know that places around Punjab as soon as Jallianwala Bagh happens erupt in protest so Gujranwala they rise up and the British uh, the British government or the British Indian government whatever drop bombs on them and that's in one of the parliament um, discussions so I just wondered if, if that had uh, somehow managed to trickle into the army but from what I can gather it doesn't seem actually, to make much you know, of a difference now that you've said this uh, it just reminded me that actually there was a newspaper article which is actually linked to this because uh, there there was an army, there was a commission at the time yeah. ongoing, and there, it, it was in the newspapers that the Secretary of State for India has asked whether they should ask Indian officers at Hampton Court, one of them, to join this commission to uh, extract their views on how to deal with the volatile situation in Punjab. Oh, wow. Um, I can share that article with you. Yeah, yeah, please, um, that's interesting. Because at the time, that commission didn't have representation from the Indian Army, not not from Indian officers in the Indian Army, British yeah. officers, yes. Yeah. And the, uh, the, the, the thinking in the article was, we've got these Indian officers here at Hampton. Let's use them. So shall we, shall we, there was a question was, shall we use one? Even they had a decision hadn't been made to use one. They were asking amongst themselves, is it worthwhile asking one of them to join our commission? to ask their views on the volatile situation in Punjab. It's really interesting. Um, it's really interesting. But yeah, no, no, thank you. It's just one of those questions that you're like, well, hold on, things are happening at the same time. Like, do they have any kind of connection? So these people are based in Hampton Court Palace. And correct me if I'm wrong, they're based there every time. 1902, 1911, 1919, in 1937. Okay. So what impact does that have on the wider kind of British Indian relations, but also kind of the social political landscape. Because as you said, like first time they turn up, you got a lady or someone nicking some food, and so the second time they kind of change it a little, little bit. Um, and by 1937, things are like you're almost getting to the cusp now of the start of the Second World War and stuff like that. So like, how is these soldiers, these Indian Army soldiers? And I think it should, it's a good point to make, which is they're not just Sikh soldiers. You've no. got Hindu soldiers, Muslims, Sikhs, Gurkhas. Castes, Gurkhas, yeah, you've got people who don't technically come from a particular religion and follow perhaps some type of caste or, or kind of uh, village tradition. But how is their continual kind of arrival there impacting just the wider relations between Britain and India and also just the kind of social landscape? Understanding each each decade has its own kind of characteristic story, doesn't it? Really, because in 1902, they arrive and they weren't supposed to be here for as long as they ended up. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, they arrive. Yeah. And then um, 
the king has appendicitis. So the coronation <laughs> gets delayed. His coronation was delayed. Yeah. So these so. guys then have to stay a lot longer than they planned to stay for. And were they, I, I can't imagine they were happy, like the soldiers themselves well, were happy about it. Well, this is quite interesting. Yeah, so so there's, a, there's an interesting article in one of their papers and it shows um, a Muslim soldier at prayer, you know, in yeah. facing Makkah with the, the carpet and doing his prayers. And the caption is that he's praying for the king's speedy recovery <laughs> so he can go home. <laughs> go home. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, so I just thought that's, that's quite like, because they're stuck interest... in a park yeah, yeah. six weeks to eight weeks longer than they planned. And then the, and they're just staying there, you know. And um, the British government then decide that actually they need to go on a kind of tour of Britain. <laughs> you know, kind of let's go and show them some places, you know. Oh, and so, okay. um, so this is why then these soldiers end up all over the place. They end up going up to a... In 19, yeah, the yeah. 1902. It's like, Glasgow, Warwick, Warwick. They came to Warwick Castle. London soon. Yeah, they came to London in the car of London. But this is interesting because I remember reading when I was putting together the video about um, the Carl Sajat Ha'a was good daughter. Yeah. And there's an article from 1911 or 1919 yeah, talking yeah. about they That's get right. Indian Army soldiers and they bring them to somewhere to celebrate Guru Gobind Singh Ji's. So, should I... Blood. Oh, like, let's, no, that's a different. Okay, that's a different one. Yeah. Shall I tell you this story? Yeah, yeah, you go for it. So what happened in 1908? The students have come over. The five students from India. Yeah. They're just Singh plus four others. Yeah, yeah. They've come in, um, sent by his son Uttar Singh Mathan yep. to establish Sikhi in the West via the student visa route, right? So they will come, always best come to the UCL, come to Cambridge, etc. But with the mission to um, establish Sikhi, and actually, it's. Um, 29th of December 1908 so in yeah so in Caxton Hall that's London, where they did it yeah yeah it was at Caxton Hall but it wasn't those students who did it it was a gentleman a different gentleman who was doing something about freedom fighters of India and took Guru Govind Singh Ji as a freedom fighter of India and decided to celebrate his birthday oh, at Caxton Hall oh interesting I did wonder why yeah, yeah, yeah. he did it and his name was Veer Sarvakar who did it so he was a student in London in 1908. As in the same, as in the name that, I, like, so I'm connecting that to the RSS and... The movement that now, the BJP, the yes. methodology. Yeah. Right. So in later life, he went to Mussolini, but as a student, he was trying to get the freedom of India and he was looking up to Guru Gobind Singh Ji as a freedom fighter for people's rights in India. That, so decided, I wasn't expecting <laughs> to find that out today. Like, so he decided to just celebrate his birthday at Caxton Hall. So then the Sikhs turned up, those few Sikhs that were here in 1908. That's insane. And they had speeches and they had um, lapels and banners given out to people celebrating kind of so independence and just freedom. Just go back to them, why he was doing it. What was he after? What did you say? Freedom fighters. It's a, the early parts of the freedom movement for India. Oh, okay. So he took Guru Gobind Singh as one of the three great freedom fighters of India, you know, for human rights and things like Bloody that. Bloody hell, there's a lot that we could go with that, but that's so interesting. There is, that is good. That comes on my Caxton tour. But just a few years later, then we get to 1911. Yeah. And in the book about the Karl Sajjata, there's an article from the Times. Now, we've all got that article from the Times. It says, a proposed Sikh church in London. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? yeah. Proposed Sikh church in London. And even before the Hampton Court connection, I didn't read that. It actually says, with Indian officers from Hampton Court. So the students needed a bit of backup. Oh, I see. <laughs> so okay. They were going to see the Maharaja Patiala. They're not going to go on their own. They're students, right? You try going up to a Maharaja <laughs> on your own. So I'll let you take <laughs> over the story <laughs> there, Titch. Well, what we have in 1911, we have a... Um, so if we go back to the article, the article says a deputation of Sikhs from Hampton Court. Yeah. And in 1911, there's a group photograph of Sikh officers that you could tell they're officers because um, because of the uni the what we see on the uniform. So the Subadar, Subadar Majors. Yeah, yeah. This would have been the deputation of Sikhs. There's about 20, 25 of them in this postcard image. This would have been the deputa deputation of Sikhs that would have pressed upon the visiting Maharaja Pratyala, Bapindra Singh together with the Sikh students to say, look, and by now it's the second trip to London because it's yeah. been in 1902. Yeah, yeah. So it's like, we've got everything we want. We've we've got got but what we in what's interesting is in that postcard image of the Sikhs, we I can identify and some of us can identify five of them, names and regiments. Um, and yeah, some of them, some of them won, you know, Indian Order of Merits. Mm. They've been, they've been all over Africa. You know, they've been um, Northwest Frontier. They've got very, all five, six in individuals have got very illustrious military careers and they're here at Hampton Court in 1911. So would yeah. it be fair to say that the first Godwara in the country wouldn't have been built if it wasn't for the Hampton Court Palace Indian Army being stationed there? Because what you guys are saying is, is that they are like the 
the final piece that pushes. So the students, I get it. Santa Edja Singh is obviously spearheading it. Sure. Santa Edja Singh has obviously sent him. young students, right? I'm just, I go to universities. I mean, imagine taking five students, saying, go and meet a king and try and see if we can squeeze yeah, the cash yeah, out yeah. of him, right? So I think to think having prestigious soldiers standing behind you where you make definitely your help. Yeah, yeah. You make your but equally, of... Manoj Prabhupada Singh, and this is obviously during the Second World War, he was very much willing to get his soldiers involved in well, oh. World War Two, obviously. Yeah. So yeah. obviously there's going to be that connection as well, right? Yeah. What, what's it's... interesting is with that donation that he, he gave is the value of it. Yeah. So in sterling, it was eight thousand pounds. Yeah, and that's what but, the book says. Eight thousand. The time but, is eight thousand. But in rupees, it's sava luck. It's hundred twenty-five, which is obviously a special number. Yeah, yeah. All right. <laughs> so he gave a sava luck <laughs> to rupees. Yeah, which is eight eight grand. And how much? I, I doubt you guys will know this off the top of your head, but roughly, how much would that be in today's money? Well, I just go back to the nineteen seventies, and you could buy a house in East London for two thousand pounds. So eight thousand pounds in nineteen eleven. Was it a lot of money? A lot of money, yeah. yeah. A lot and, of money. and look where it was: Holland Park. Holland Park. So yeah. it wasn't it wasn't Hounslow. So yeah. yeah, that's insane. Yeah. That's mad. So we've gone from Virsavaka doing a commemoration to Guru Gobind Singh Ji to basically the Indian Army being stationed at these points, helping to get the Gurdwara built. Mad. Okay. That's where these little histories take you. Bro. This is insane. Yeah, I did. I wasn't expecting, expecting this when we were going to talk about no. the Indian Army at the, the the Palace Exhibition, but no. Okay. And this is where everyone says it's the same Caxton Hall. Yes, it's the same Caxton yeah, Hall. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the same Caxton Hall. the Deep Singh had the Women's Parliament. Yeah. It's the same Caxton Hall where Maharaja Pupinder Singh is on the steps with Sir Michael O'Dwyer, and it's the same Caxton Hall on 13th of March 1941. Where well, made shot. Yeah. Right. So there's Sikh history at Caxton Hall. I'm surprised it's not a good dollar. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Just missing the Nishan. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, Eight that's black. mad. It's going back to a bit of the socio background. Yeah, yeah, please. Um, mm. 1919, you 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 mentioned uh, Jalal Wanabar. Yeah, absolutely. But the other thing that's going around in in 1919 is the Spanish flu. Yeah, because it hits. Well, the influenza hits Punjab. Is it the same year when it wipes out like a hundred thousand people yeah. or something? Well, like twenty times more mortality rate for than, than the than first, first world, world war. war. Yeah, and Punjab was because the troops brought it back with them. So hence it was it was a cascade effect. So they've come here from India with possibly you know loss of many rel of their own relatives in to the Spanish flu. Um, plus you got Jalan Yeah. You know? So you, you know that's the context that we need to think about when we see eighteen hundred troops at Hampton Court. You know they come from a country where in fact their actual journey here was delayed by the Spanish. They were quarantined in other Zuis or France. Hence they missed the. Official parade with the we British Army. Official parade. Yeah. They're supposed to take part with that. Bloody hell. But because they missed it, because they had to quarantine for two weeks, King George V then said, well, I still want you to, you've come all the way, so you'll have your own one. So it was two weeks after the main one. And they had it at Hamilton Court. Peace procession for England. But, but then that took part in Admiralty Arch in central London. Bloody hell. Yeah. Might. Okay, there's so much that we can... Oh, so they had a practice at Hamilton Court, and then they did the Admiralty Arch. I'm not sure if they did a practice one at, but, uh, at Hampton Court, but they, they took the, the, the main... Or maybe that was a practice because the pictures we've got are of the side of Hampton Court. Like yeah, just, no, I, think they just, I think they just paraded. Yeah, yeah. Just parading them. Yeah. So before we just get into the exhibition kind of as an entirety, one thing that I would love to know, and this is more so to tease people watching or listening to this to actually come to the exhibition, which is, is there like one artifact or one story that each of you have from the exhibition that you think is worth sharing or something with that kind of just connects with you say on a personal level yeah uh, i i have a story yeah, uh, yeah of there's a image there's a photo which i found here at the national archives <laughs> of my great-grandfather subhadar major bawa singh 23rd Sikh pioneers so we, we had that image um as, as part of the exhibit anyway um we were contacted, or rather Rav was contacted by email from somebody in India called Mandeep Singh Chauhan. And uh, he recognized his own great-grandfather standing beside my great-grandfather. We feel his great-grandfather and two people we didn't know. Okay. So okay. Okay. his name was Subhadar Amar Singh. So first, what a great name, right? What a great name, yeah. right? Yeah. It's meant to be. Yeah. So firstly, that put a name to another person yeah, in the yeah. photo. Um, but what he went on to tell us is that um, Subhadar Amar Singh's father was also in the 23rd Sikh Pioneers 20 years prior and came to Hampton Court. Oh, wow. Okay. So he then showed me an image, a group photo of the 23rd Sikh Pioneers at Hampton Court, which we already had, 
we had that and that's part of the exhibit but then he pointed out which one's his great great grandfather which is two Amr Singh's father yeah yeah so he, we knew where he was sitting so you've effectively got father and son in two photos at the exhibit um, Bashitar Singh Su Naik Bashitar Singh and Subedar Amr Singh father and son and we didn't even know they were father and son would they have ever seen action together no because uh, of the age gap yeah the age gap yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and interestingly Mandeep had a a photo of my great grandfather which we didn't have um, so there's a photo of Subedar Major Bawa Singh with a dog next to him and all his medals on and uh, uh, with his bend at the bottom and uh, Banjoria and uh, Jangpuria. And, uh, you know, he's given me a good scan. But, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm still hopeful of getting the actual photo. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but, getting the so, original, isn't it? Original. Yeah, it's very yeah. different. Um, so, but, yeah, yes, I think, yes, when we, we curate these exhibitions and we come up with these stories, I think for me, you know, having the Carl Sajata book here and never ever paying attention to Hampton Court, but through the exhibition, Hampton Court, then the photograph, then the Sikh church, and then it's snippets of Punjab, you know, yeah. like New Zealand, you yeah. got the Sawalak, and then Amandit Madara picked up on that as well. And so you know, all these little connections and they come, all come together. together. Yeah, and yeah, it was yeah. like, oh, hold on, and now I've got a little clip in there and a little postcard. And suddenly I've got a whole story. Of that, that one little thing. When we do the tour, it's just like, actually, there's so much um, that that story's come to life. And I think one of the other aspects that, that works for me in this, originally it was going to be one room, yeah. then it went to another room. And in the other room, they decided to have audio visual, like a film being made. And with that film, the palace decided to commission a filmmaker. And then we did a worldwide call out in English and Punjabi looking for descendants. Wow. You know, and it was amazing because I'll let Tej pick up. But I think through Tej, his networks and this worldwide call out, we ended up with stories from each of the coronations and each of those events. So, right. yeah, so they... Vancouver to India, basically. And they've all been interviewed at the palace. They all came. You, they're the interviews you can watch. Oh, wow. What was perhaps the most random country that one of these people came from? No, it was. It was Canada, India, yeah. London, all of them. Oh, England. majority. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, basically, either UK, Canada, or, or India. Because they're India. second or third yeah, or fourth yeah, generation. Yeah, yeah. That's As in, there was no one like from Fiji or something. No. Not yet. No, I think we, we ended up with hundreds of items being submitted through the call up. But the problem is they don't link to Hampton. You know, to do an exhibition at Hampton. Yeah, yeah, it has to be bang on. Yeah, and that's yeah. why I found that a lot of my collection is that I've got interesting Indian Army items here. But it's not necessarily but actually, that. actually, when we went into those meetings, the way the curators work and the way the storytellers yeah. work, it has to link to spaces. Yeah. And connects. And that's where we were fortunate with Tej Bal's collection, which is Hampton, um, Ian Franklin, Import, John Schaefer, was it, John? John Sheaf. John Sheaf. His, you know, we were able to pick up Hampton through local collectors. And then the little bit of wider stuff is there. Um, but it, even there, I expected like the Sikh church story not to make it, but it got made in because of the Hampton connection. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah, that's yeah, how it got yeah, made. Yeah, and then, so that's how. So every item, then we walk around, it's been a journey of two years of evaluating that item and coming up with a story to put it in or out. And more got selected out. They oh, really? selected in. Okay, let because me. Because of the space constraint. Space constraint. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. You can only fit so much in. Okay, let me rephrase that question. If there was one thing that you could take and you could keep it, from this exhibition. And and this doesn't have to be just what's made it. It could be the stuff that you've had to kind of cut and, and it's not made the exhibition. If there was one item that you could keep and there would be no issues and it wouldn't be, you wouldn't be stealing it or whatever like that, right? If there was one item that you could keep, what would it be and why? Because I think that actually pulls the, the, the most interesting items out of, of, of the kind of the whole collection. So for me, I've seen these items before through Tej because we've got such a close collection, you know, the, the, the medals I've seen before. Uh, about 75% of it is mine. Yeah. Oh, so you're so, going to keep it anyway. So that's the problem. But, yeah. the one item, but the one item for me is probably Sophia's pin badge, right? And is it, is, it, yeah. is it hers? So what happens is there's a photo from the Museum of London at Haymarket because we tell the story in the yeah, door. Yeah. She's standing there with the equivalent of poppies. They've got them sitting there yep. and all their women's institute ladies yep, and yep. her, she's standing there. And that was phenomenal. They sold these elephants on a pin. It's a little pin badge with an elephant and you wear it like a poppy. It's in this, you've got an image of it on the website, on the on Hampton the website, website yeah, 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 but, yeah. But there's very few that are left in the world, right? I've never, uh, to be honest, I've never seen it. When it's I saw on that display, photo, I was a bit on, like, yeah. oh, this is new. So it's on display, but selling those through their networks and through the princess and through the women and whatever they were doing, yeah. what they were trying to do was the, the soldiers had come in summer uniforms. So this is 1914. 
they left India in August when yeah, yeah. khaki summer cotton <laughs> shirts and arrive in September on the onset of winter. Oh, yes. So what they needed is heavier uniforms made like to European to withhold them. Yeah, yeah. The so winter. they did this fundraiser selling these equivalent of poppies. And they raised over a million pounds. Raised over a million pounds so they oh, could actually like get Like a million sold. pounds at that time? At that time, or the equivalent of a million pounds. I think, pounds. Yeah. I think the equivalent oh, okay, of a million the equivalent. pounds. Yeah, that's, right? that's still impressive though. And then they got organised and they sewed uniforms and they sent them to the Western Front so they could actually have some protection from the cold. You know? And this is being organised by that's women massive. here, led by Sophia, who was campaigning for this, and her sisters, together with other Indian women here. And what together what with year is this? 1914? And the photographs, 1915, 15. I think, from the Haymarket. So at the same time that she's yeah. fighting for suffragettes' rights, she's also actively supporting Indian the soldiers. British mm. Indian Army and... 100%. Yeah. And there's another story that comes uh, out of that. Yeah, please go ahead. Because should we go to, what, 1919? That's with, right, yeah. Yeah. yeah, so 1919, these soldiers so, are at Hampton. Yeah. The soldiers were at Hampton, um, as they were for the peace contingent. And um, what's emerged, in fact, two of our case studies are directly related to this. Um, the Sikh soldiers of the 1800, of which you, you know, maybe there's two or 300 Sikhs, they were invited and they went across the road to this Grace and Favour property where Sophia the Leapsing lived, probably for tea. Afternoon tea. And um, there's a guest book, if you like. There's a guest book with, with names and, and, and regiments uh, of each soldier yeah, yeah. who kind of signed their name. And in fact, one or two of them signed it in Punjabi. Um, so this came up in auction recently. You know, It's not part of our collection. Somebody else has it in Canada okay. now. But uh, um, it's fascinating to see that these soldiers came over to meet Princess Sophia Dalip Singh and there's actual photographs in the garden, if you like, okay. Faraday House. Surely the British are seeing themselves that connect them with Indian Army soldiers. 1919. You've yep. got the daughter of... Granddaughter, yes. Yes. Ranjit Singh. Ranjit Singh. Yes. Like, have you come across anything that is kind of like we shouldn't be letting these people talk? Because surely that it could turn into a powder keg of its own. Well, I mean, we, we, all we have is... Uh, so there's a lot of letters written by Sophia. We, we don't have... Them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but nothing of that nature. Nothing, okay. politi nothing political. So she's uh, very much... She, I think it was just innocent tea... Uh, she, she was kind she of like them are country move. folk. Yeah. Let's, yeah. let's well, kind yeah. of bend the kind of it. thing. Okay. That's right. So, um, would it be fair to say then that, and this is not necessarily connected directly to the exhibition, but would it be fair to say with the Leap Singh's passing, the, the whole concept of ever trying to reclaim any ounce of sovereignty kind of went with him because it doesn't seem like his kids are that bothered? Or has the situation? It's kind of like then yeah, I don't think I don't think the boys were that that much incredible. Yeah, because Frederick, really have, yeah, yeah he's really shooting really, and yeah, hunting really, and drinking and yeah. So what was gambling in one? Yeah, 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 having a great time. <laughs> well, even with the leap sing, it came late in his life. Yeah, late. yeah, yeah, and it so, was it was yeah. a ploy to try and get more money more yeah. than than be ideological. And I think his daughters. I think um, with Sophia, everything I read about her and in the Who's Who, I think of nineteen thirty five. In the who's who, yeah, you know, she could fill a page with who's who, right? Because she <laughs> she had that many titles and that many honorary things, and um, she was a kennel club member, a cyclist, um, keen environmentalist, women suffrage, and all she wrote for the who's who was for the advancement of women. That's it. It's got Sophia the Leap thing for the advancement of women. Nothing about being I goddaughter. Think that shows it very clearly. Yeah. yeah. So, and I think her sister Catherine, what she did with. Um, the German refugee yeah. children bring yeah. them to their their house in Penn. She's in the, the one who is in the lesbian relationship with the female partner, isn't it? In Germany, and they, help, they moved to yeah. Germany, but they they smuggled them um, children. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, they help Jewish so many children. It's called the Sieg Schindler. Um, so there will be films made about this in the of future. Course. I think you know it's just that obvious. And then Bamba. So I think Bamba, Catherine, and Sophia were more connected to Lahore and Punjab than the brothers were. Let's face it. Yeah, though. that's yeah, that's that's and, pretty fair. And Bamba went back and spoke of herself as the Queen of Lahore, right? And she settled there and she yeah, yeah. there. So but I don't think they actually claimed any no. kind of sovereign sovereignty. No, they would call themselves princesses of Lahore. You know, um, I am the princess of Lahore. But I guess at that point it's more of a of a high Titan. Yeah, it's a title there, yeah. So um and I, I suppose Everything they had was 
kind of not formal. It was kind of at the mercy of the British government. Yeah, yeah. Any, any kind of, because their father had the kind of entitlement and then that kind of seeped away in the yeah. next generation. Yeah, no, so We should just add though, in 1919, when they came over across the road to yeah. carry their house to me, that wasn't the first, our first interaction. So our first interaction in fact, was actually uh, the, the pavilion in Brighton in uh, 1915. When they opened it? No, when the soldiers, when the soldiers were evacuated from the Western Front to be. Oh, sorry, when, the, when, when they, they were, were put at the hospital. Not, yeah. we're not talking. Yeah. Oh, sorry, I thought you meant you were talking about the Shatri, the like the 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 white. Same that story. came afterwards. Yeah, that okay, came okay, yeah. okay. So okay, originally, okay. when they were in the Brighton Pavilion, yes. where they were being uh, in the hospital, isn't it? Yeah, 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 that's right. It was converted into a makeshift hospital. So she, they used to send over people, like Indian medical students, to go and nurse these. Um, Soldiers. soldiers. Yeah. yeah. There, is it was story. there was another story, isn't it? White nurses weren't. This is the thing. That white, white women were allowed to nurse Indian men. And would, my question on that is, and I'm not surprised at that. My question is, where, who is that like the soldiers are like, we don't want white women touching us, or are the white women like, we no, don't I want mean, to touch these brown people? I think it's a government instruction. It's probably a government instruction. Um, okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So one of these um, women was Sophia the Leap Singh. She went. She was trained as a nurse, and we know this because some of the soldiers wrote back to their families to say, we can't believe we've been visited by the granddaughter of the King Ranjit, and we're shocked that she speaks Punjabi, Yeah, which we don't even, <laughs> I'm shocked with. Yeah, yeah so yeah, even yeah. when she came and back from Lahore, it was one of their defiant things that Catherine Bamber and Sophia um, refused to speak in English to each other, kind of defying what Queen Victoria wanted because she was the Empress of India. These kind of stuff, they started, you know, they learned um, Punjabi and Urdu when they were in Lahore. And then they only spoke to each other in kind of code, I suppose, when they were trying to. <laughs> you know, I love, I'd love to put doing it this. all right, you know. So I love so, doing this, yeah. And she gave them a gift, you know, sometimes a pair of socks, sometimes, because this is all documented in letters. Bloody hell. They wouldn't use it, uh, like gifted way. Yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. going to just like, <laughs> that's it. Frame Send it, it back to put it on my wall. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So, so that, that, uh, that uh, second second time they met in 1919, you know, that wasn't the f her first interaction. Yeah, so she yeah. obviously, you know, had that empathy for the Indian soldiers, particularly the Sikhs. Yeah. Um, yeah. And before that, it was the Lascars. Before them, it was the Lascars. Always her countrymen from India. And, and so, so what, what was she doing in relation so to those guys? the Lascars were coming over on ships, mainly from Calcutta, but Sikhs were coming onto ships from Calcutta and then on yep. the trade routes with the merchant yeah, yeah. ships and all of that, coming into Black Wall. Um, it was called the Black Wall because the walls were painted black, so you couldn't um, see what's coming in to try and steal the spices from India and all that. Oh, so, okay, So okay. the Black Wall yeah, tunnel yeah, yeah. is next to the Black Walls of the East <laughs> India Dock. Okay. okay. Um, and she... Um, she organized, because basically what would happen, the ship would come in, they would then roam the streets of the East End or Hackney yeah. until the ship being to get ready to go back. And they would be just stuck in Seaman's houses yeah, along yeah. the um, East India Road, basically. And I think she organized for a, a, a place for Indian soldiers where they could get their own food <laughs> and all of that stuff. <laughs> Love and it. it's near, um, it's on the East India Road. There's a Holiday Inn or a Premier Inn hotel there now. So it's still a kind of a hotel restaurant. <laughs> But it's like 110 years on from when she organised for that to be open. Because otherwise, you'd be just destitute on the streets around Insane. the East End. So at the beginning, we obviously spoke about how the idea for this exhibition has kind of sprouted over the last six, seven years or so. Now, I just want to get an idea more immediately. What was involved in putting it together? And how did you get it off the floor? So like as in going from concept is fine and I get it. You've had to do all these Zoom calls and make sure all the items connect and the stories and all, like a hell of a lot of work. But like, how does it go from that to... Shall I pick this one up, Tish? Because yeah. I think from my side, we are the community curators. That's right. So it's our collections and our stories and the checks and babbles that we do. Behind is the power of the HRP team, like historical <laughs> palace. I think there's some emails with about 26 different people CC'd in. So you have Jatinda Serious. and Zakira. So Zakira is lead curator. At the palace. At the palace. Okay. She's open, and she's already working on her next, next exhibition. So they don't <laughs> even get to enjoy the exhibition. We're loving it. We're going like every twice a week, you know. And Zakira's, oh, I'm sorry, I'm over here. Jatinda's the community producer. Okay. Jatinda works at the Tower of London, but she works at the palace on this nice. one. Nice. So, and she's, you know, she's been doing this for a long time. Then we've had Sophie on the media side. We've had Claudia on the podcast side. We've got the kitchen guy, Richard from the kitchens, who's coming up with all these stories of the food. We've got Sebastian. We've had Simran, Peter Vance's daughter actually designed some of the maps. Nice. So when the, when the palace put their effort behind it, 
you know, it's, it's not just me and him who actually did like all night trying to get. Yeah, these you know, that's what I'm trying to get out. Yeah, you know, yeah, they've yeah. had I mean, a film made, they've had podcasts made, they've gone out to people and recorded bird song at Hampton and put that to the background of the letters. You know, we got letters translated by using community. And that's why it's been a bit more enjoyable for me. It's like, it's not like my tools where I have to do everything. Right? Yeah, the admin, yeah, yeah. The emails, You've got a big team the, helping you in it. Yeah. yeah. I've actually worked out how yeah. we can just do our job yeah. and let the machine carry on moving, you know? Yeah, we, we've, between Rav and I, we've probably given majority of the of the, of the the collection there. Yeah. Mm. Um, so as Rav said, we're the community curators. Um, but there's a big team from Historic Royal Palaces behind this, which without which, and they organized, they did everything. Um, you know, we, we basically turn up to meetings. Yeah, we turn up to meetings. We give our oh. advice, but they do the procurements, the finance, the cost codes that generate the business cases. And literally, you know, it takes a long time and it takes a lot of meetings because, you know, you can't damage the floor. You can't yeah. do this. Well, you yeah, do yeah. That, you know? I have to it's go, a historic I, padded. I have to buy special padded things for my camera stand so that exactly. I don't damage the floor when I come yeah. on Monday, right? Because if that's scratch, yeah, yeah, they're, yeah. they're left with the bill, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and I'm not getting sued. I'll tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so all of this stuff we've I mean I've watched because we're all three of us here we're micro businesses right? yeah, we do everything yeah, yeah. ourselves right yeah, yeah. and you know we're growing like the first podcast I did with you I showed you that we're bringing people in yeah, yeah, now we completely. have 10 people on the tour team 10 people on the author but they're still all micros we're yeah, all 10 yeah, micro yeah. businesses no one's got access to a free photocopy or something you know we're all still doing it all ourselves but the palace I think they've come into it wholeheartedly because of it's their story and they want to showcase yeah, their yeah. story. And when I saw that actually it's not an exhibition about Sikki, it's not an exhibition about Punjab. Is you know, so we're everything I would have I was have yeah. this, have this, have this. Doesn't necessarily it doesn't relate. Connect. Yeah, so yeah, that yeah. took me about six months to get my head down <laughs> and look through everything again with a Hampton angle. You know, and now it's um the producers, the events, the lectures we've got going on, inviting you guys into them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. actually today not knocked back any idea we've no. asked for i mean you know, we just just on that note this there's the outcome there's several outcomes of this and one of them is the exhibition yeah the other one is the silhouettes yeah that's where we started but the other one is actually when i mentioned at the beginning we've actually got an interpretation board now yes where, where, where david actually said wouldn't it be nice and now we've got one <laughs> uh which again was only unveiled full we circle unveiled yeah, the, yeah, yeah yeah so exhibition between, the so. plaque and the interpretation board, I know I've got tours there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, you know, I, it's, yeah, 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 definitely. And that's permanent, you know. So the exhibition will probably come and go, but the, but that the board will is be there. there. And there's so many locals, whenever I've gone, there's so many locals who walk their dogs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and they say, we've been there for 26 years. We, we didn't know, know about know. the home park was used for. Mm -hmm. um, because over the four visits, there's four and a half thousand soldiers. A lot of people. You've got 1,200 in 1902. You've got about 600 in 1911. 1800 in 1919 and about another 650 in 1937. Yeah. So, and just, the Punjab well, being a large proportion of that, I keep saying to people, look, see, before South, we had home. We had a finger to ourselves, you know. I like that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know? Where were Sikhs first settled, settled in England? In England? It's a trick question, yeah. isn't it? It's Hampton, mate. It's oh, in the palace. <laughs> I wanted to ask you something about the exhibition and it's now slipped my mind, which is that always the best right. come to. Um, so the only reason I ask about how much went into doing this exhibition is because I'm trying to guilt trip everyone listening to this or watching it to come to the exhibition. Because I think the thing is, is, and I'm of an age now where I vaguely remember the Arts of the Sea Kingdoms exhibition, but I really remember like the Golden Temple exhibition and the stuff the UKPH did. And I think without things like that, the realization that I could do kind of, when I say do, micro businesses again, but like die, the, just the reality that there is Sikh history or Punjabi history or however you want to define it, that can fill an exhibition or can fill a museum was a game changer. Now, there's people like you and, and others who have been putting these exhibitions on and are still doing it. And it's amazing, but they're only worth it if people turn up and I think that's one thing that I really want to stress to people listening and watching. And also the main reason why I wanted to come down and do the recording in person is because you guys are all doing the work and it's taken six years, seven years. The, 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 the smallest we can do as a community is to support you and however that is, whether that's turning up and going to the exhibition or doing a podcast or, just sharing, or sharing. The yeah, yeah, completely. You know? So I want to ask you then in terms of like, to give an idea to people watching and listening is, 
what can they expect at the exhibition? What are they going to see? What type of items are there? Like, how do you bring this exhibition to life? I know we've been talking about all sorts, but to give someone in a, I don't know, a couple of sentences, an idea of what they're going to be encountering without giving too much away, like, how is this exhibition being brought to life? Okay, so we've got, you, you could divide it. It's a small, it's a relatively small space. Yeah. We've managed to pack in quite a lot. Um, so you have, some of them are items of uniform, which were, would be worn at the time yeah. by some of the Sikh regiment. And are they contemporary? So they are from the time. They're not like re modern remakes or no, anything? No, no, it's an original piece. Okay. Yeah. Um, we also have several postcards depicting yeah. life at the palace, which could include laundry or, or even sports. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because um, they had to do something with the time. Um, we have several... Um, Last week, say, well, no, we got about... so I think videos are in quite impressive. We yeah. mainly capture some videos in Hampton. So, I think for me, it's like I've been to all the exhibitions you're talking about. You know, the VL was a volunteer guiding people to the toilets, right? <laughs> That's my main job in 1999. Then I went to all of them and the and UK PHA's exhibitions, yeah, yeah, yeah. actually bought groups there before I even started the little history, you know. And but for me, the difference here is they had big space and they were they had big, yeah, yeah, like, it was a two huge exhibition, of, massive, know, and that was a different type of exhibition, yeah, yeah. The difference here for me is, let's say for the exhibition, this is probably the first time you're going to hear Punjabi at the palace. We actually did sound recordings, reversed the letters back into Punjabi or the Hindi, recorded them with artists from the theatre academies. And then now that's when Amazing. you go on Monday, you're going to hear Amazing. Punjabi in a yeah. palace, right? You've got the video room with the stories of descendants because this isn't an exhibition about the palace. It's an exhibition about the Indian army people at the palace. It's their stories, their descendant story. It's their experience, their cooks, their kitchen. It's about them. It's not about the king and queen came to visit. Love it. Because the Love palace it. has all their cooks yeah, yeah. the king and queen. Yeah, you know, really yeah, really shook hands with this officer and shook hands with that one. So that, there's none of that in there. There's nothing from the palace in the exhibition apart from the pin badge from Sophia. Yeah. Everything else is from the community about the people who came to that palace. And, you know, we had lots of meetings about how can we, you know, fit to, into the future. You know, there was words used which didn't happen. They would wanted to bring women into those camps, and women didn't come to the camps in 1919, 1902 from India. From India, they wanted the, to bring their women no, folk. They, no, because no, no. they there was there was a there was a kind of a hint that could there have been women. No, for what? the palace team, they were asking us. You know, uh, apart they, from all these men, know. would any women have come? Oh, for okay. example, the followers, the, yeah. the camp, yeah. the non-combatants, like the the dozens. yeah, the whatever. I said no, they're all men. And this, and but they were insisting that uh, no, there must be women. I'm like no. Because, you know, there's, and all these little, they could get tense, but yeah. we tried to hold out. But that's why the commu you community creators come in, because you understand the culture, the religion, yeah. the setup, and the exactly. way things would have worked at that point, right? I think so. And I think that's the video room. You know, people sit and watch the video, they can hear the sound, they can see. But I think um, for me, it's the special thing about this is someone said to us some feedback. They came on a tour, and I'll tell you something else. They said to me that, they said they were a very elderly couple. Yeah, yeah. They came and, you know, we looked after them. And they were part of a big group and there was only two elderly. And they sat down after about four hours with us and they must have been tired. And he goes, I just want to tell you something. And I didn't, I didn't. I said, Jalan, give you back. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I'll listen. Yeah, I'll listen. <laughs> yeah, listen. And he gave me his card and he's got the MBEs and all this stuff. And I don't know who he is, but he's a local. And he said, you know, in my time, I've been doing this and this and this. And he goes, I've been to Holland, I've met with the ambassadors, I do London, I do the, and all this stuff about ambassadors. And he goes, you two have done something which the ambassadors Can't haven't do. been able to yeah, do. Yeah. He goes, you have put our stories into their space. He goes, ambassadors meet the royal families, they meet the palaces, they go to these things 10 times a year, and they only talk about their stories. They only talk about India or yeah, Punjab, yeah, yeah, but yeah. They, and you've actually put Take it in it their, their space. space. Yeah, and, yeah. Thought, oh, and he, then he told you the same story, two minutes later. Two minutes later, And then he went and told, told the next person, <laughs> and then the next person. <laughs> so I just thought, you know, that's quite touching coming from him because no, he's definitely. experienced it. And I, for me, that's an impact. But, you know, for me, it's we're still a little history. We still, what we have been given in this exhibition is curatorial rights. Yeah. So we organize Sikh Heritage Days, Punjab Heritage Days. I've got groups coming. You know, we've done three at half term. We were supported by Hounslow, Gurdwara, way over the number, I told them. They bought a double-decker <laughs> yeah, coach. Punjab coaches came across the palace. Double-decker, 85 people got off that coach. 
they came in, the palace put on teas and coffees, hot drinks, rooms. That's brilliant. You settle in, you get our presentation in English, Punjabi, whatever you want, we'll do it. Then we take you to Safai's if you want, we come back, we take you through. And then they get free tickets to come back for another time. So on my days, on Little History Days, it's free. I only charge on the website as a commitment to turn up because everyone books and then doesn't turn up. So we've had 85, 75, 65. So I'm confident through our previous work with the partnerships we've got. But, you know, I'm not asking Punjabi communities to turn up on mass if they really do find a financial barrier. We have a lot of Sink Heritage Days planned and we'll keep doing them. So you come in through us for yeah. free and we'll work something out with yourself where people, you know, genuinely, yeah. if they want to go, you'll save 180 pound, you know, family of four, you know, you'll save big money. But enjoy the day, enjoy the palace, and maybe then there'll be less. Um, when it's a free ticket, the blood pressure's not that high. Uh, so I do free tickets to the Kohinoor through my tours. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and if I charge them thirty-five pound to see it, their blood pressure's quite high. They start. And they'll swearing definitely come up at least, all right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. They start going, "I'll start diamond and all this kind of." But when you got a free compliment, as they cut the swearing, just no turn anger, off. just turn yeah, up, yeah, appreciate yeah. the story. You appreciate what the palace have done to re-edit that story and present in a new make way. Make a good yeah, and yeah. and learn something, and then write your books and make your films and do something in the future with this history. You know, in fact, that was on one of the day excursions when they were waiting for we to Henry, the, not yeah. Henry, uh, Edward the Seventh, where he had appendicitis. So one of the day excursions to fill up the time was Tower of London, and. Um, I'm pretty sure there's a newspaper article where the soldiers said, well, we want to take it back. We'll take back to India. I was just yeah. about to ask, surely no. these guys are like, what the hell is going on? They went this... to Westminster Abbey as well. The... Westminster Abbey, yeah, we've got images of them with the, on, the, on the banks of the Thames. Yeah, yeah. sitting quite almost as if they owned the House of Lords. Oh, I love it. Oh, this is that very out of the House of Lords where they're sat in, in and yeah. it, you can see yeah. the river on, on That's right. this yeah. side. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I didn't realise that was from that. That's a day out. That's a day out. <laughs> That's, so they're That's just out on a jolly. They had many a day outs on the jolly. Um, Not bad. All over, not just in London, but all over the place. That's insane. Woolwich, Arsenal, Portsmouth, Southampton, Warwick, Birmingham. They went to uh, the small arms, the, the 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 factory where they make arms in Birmingham. I forgot. Darleston is somewhere like that. Um, where they stamp the weapons. They went there to. Um, well, Panama question, and my last question about the exhibition, at least, which is, how does the exhibition challenge or confirm historical narratives surrounding the Indian Army in England during the early twentieth century? So I think modern narratives of colonial history is very, uh, at the moment, very polemic. How does this exhibition either challenge these kind of misconceptions or confirm, mis like, as in, like, how does this exhibition fit into the colonial era of the time? And what does it kind of say about the relationship between not just British and Indians, but also between soldiers and their superiors? Because there's obviously not just color but there's caste there's country there's kind of the colonial occupier and and the occupied like how do all of those identities come together in this exhibition well, one of the ways that's manifested is if you look at the martial race theory which really had its genesis um in the mutiny and post-mutiny period um it was it was a it was this it was this theory where you know policy making individuals in India had this idea that certain men can carry arms and certain men can't. Yeah. And um, what happened in the 1902 coronation camp is uh, almost this sort of experimentation with genesis and eugenics um, where um, this ethnographic study was done on around 10% of the coronation contingent, around 156 soldiers from about 20 regiments, about six men from each regiment, they, they measured the heights and uh, width of their head, width and breadth of their skulls, basically, the heads. Um, met, you know, calculated certain ratios for each caste, for each ethnic group. They, they determined what's called the cephalic index, where they divide okay. uh, yeah, the, height by, the width by the height. Um, but they, they did it to determine the purity of each community. Um, so they said, oh, the Brahmins are very pure oh, because sure. they, their standard deviation is like minimum. Yeah. Um, whereas other communities like Balochis and stuff, you know, even the Sikhs, you know, they're, they're quite far from the standard deviation. So they've had more mixing. You know, this is, this was done in the 1902 camp and oh, published in the Royal, yeah. okay. Royal um, Anthropological Institute carried out the study in one of the anthropological journals that was published, Journal of Anthropology. 
So I think, you know, that that prevailing thought in that Victorian Britain of different communities, this actually determined their recruitment practices yeah. for different regiments. These communities can't serve with these communities, so we'll have separate regiments for them. Well, I was reading Kushwan Singh's History of the Sikhs the other day, only to read the chapter about First World War and Second World War in order to try and prepare for this, right? Because <laughs> cause like, my knowledge of this era is, it's okay, but you need to know what you're talking about, right? And he's saying that on the outbreak of the First World War, there's like 100,000 Punjabis, and correct me if I'm wrong, within the British Indian Army. But by like the end of 1915, that's risen by like three or four times the number because they are just like, are you Sikh? Yeah, all right, let's go. So in a lot of ways, this theory, depends how you look at it, does the Sikh community favours, but also puts us at the front of fighting these wars. We were disproportionately recruited. Yeah. No question about that, yeah. given our ratio in the population. Yeah, yeah, between. and that's something that's continued Yeah, even now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, well, it works both ways, it does, but the Sikhs, they get employment opportunities out of yeah, it. They, they yeah. get this career, military, even to this day. Um, and people get land grants, like you were talking earlier about land grants and stuff, like once right. you've served so, a particular, you know, like how does it work? Do you have to serve a particular amount of time or? Yeah, I'm not sure the specifics of it. Um, I think maybe 20 years or something like this. You know, otherwise people will drop out after yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's um, just impossible. I'm not sure what the period is, but. Um, but there are and maybe rewards. you get more land or less land if you have you have some gallantry medals or something. Yeah, else. yeah, yeah. Um, okay. But yeah. But they did get a jiggy of land. They did, yeah. Alec and two. We've, we've, um, you know, displayed one or two pages of this paper at the exhibition. <laughs> nice. So, well, I'm definitely looking forward to Monday because there's going to be a lot of fun. And equally, I have to say thank you for the invite. So what they do is they do these press campaigns and they did one in September, which we sent to you. But I said to them, look, I need to do something with the Punjabi media. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. And then um, obviously there was only, it's our journey as well with little history. Yeah, yeah. We're a little community <laughs> now, you know. So I'd invited the ones who had the podcast with me and that. And to be honest, the big players don't. They won't. They won't put the time into. Well, I'm always happy it. to so support like, us, man. Because I'm a cover. Yeah, you know, always here, channels. man. And then I said, look, that's my little. Group. You don't even have to think about it. Yeah, there. I'm there. Just and it was shadow. Cheap. And we are, you know, we are. Um, Touchwood is going well. Yeah. You know, the Palace are happy with, with how it, I think it's being, um, absorbed yeah. here and in India and wherever else. Um, and we, you know, there are negotiations going on now for the nice. next one. Nice. Know, so, so this is how it starts to grow, yep. isn't it? You know, so not Mo just for us, but a lot of for everyone. A lot yeah. of this is dependent on the feedback we get from people who come. Yeah, uh, firstly, people coming and then giving good feedback. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the palace will make a decision of you know how do we you know do we carry on? Do we you know do we do another one? Do we yeah. do something else? Because, yeah, yeah. Because ideally, you know, we saw that space before it was turned into an exhibition, and it was a quiet, redundant space for years. And now that it's been brought into an exhibition space, there's probably demands on it. Yeah, yeah. But definitely. we're kind of asking, why can't it just be permanent? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's a true point, especially if it was a bit of a dead zone before. Because it's only Hampton. Yeah, no, You yeah. can't take it to the Tower of London because it's Hampton. Yeah, yeah, it's actually related to, yeah, the, yeah. to the actual place. No, touche. My last question. Are any particular Sikh histories, and when I say Sikh, it could just be like a Sikh soldier or a Sikh. Like, I'm really interested to find out about the Sikh dietary requirements and how that was all kind of... Try to, Richard can come down to yeah, see if he's how, how that was kind of managed and what their requirements were and how the meat was like, did they literally have goats on site that they then killed themselves and ate or was the meat more like, as in, dude, look, because... Shall I tell you another story? Yeah, yeah go for it. This is another story, right? So in the Times newspaper, so you know Victorians have um, a central garden. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, it's gated and then all the houses around. You see this in Chelsea. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. That's your communal garden in the middle, right? And then the houses around the outside and you all have a key. Nowadays, you have a committee and a key. Okay. You know, so only the people who own flats Only can access, come. yeah, yeah. Actually, there's a story back into the 1908, <laughs> 1911 days with these Sikhs, you know, from India and whatever. They turned up at one of these gardens with a small goat in tow, <laughs> performed a ceremony. <laughs> and, and had a great meal afterwards, a, right? Right. And then the onlooking, um, you know, Edwardian families are looking over going, what this the? is not a communal space, this is our <laughs> space. And that's the genesis of now, you know, residents associations having oh. gated parts where only those communities can go to before they were more communal. Love it. Anyone could come in. But once these kind of, unwarranted activity started to go <laughs> on in the, uh, you know, by the turbaned people from India, you know? And, uh, Love it. They suddenly decided in Belgravia that 
No, you not know, well. You'd have to have a key and a terms of reference. And a... It might be a little bit traumatic for others, right? Watching yeah, yeah. such so an incident that take was, place. I was finding that hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> just like, before that, they were just gardens, communal gardens. Well, well that, for that question, um, which one? Sikh histories. Oh, because there's um, there a poignant note here, you know, so like you say, I mean, my origins are, we called ourselves a little history of the Sikhs. And I didn't take the advice of a senior person, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, and he had said to me, like, if you just call it a little history of the Punjab, yeah, it's a wider thing. It's but, bigger cut. But my reading was all Sikh history. Same so here. So that's the, you're more comfortable. Same here. When you're a yeah, little yeah. nobody in 2012 trying to go onto Facebook, you know, I can't talk about Lahore and... Um, and it's what is so comfortable be, as well, right? Like, right. we know it almost. We kind of read enough yeah. to put ourselves out there on it. But he did say to me at that time, and I said, no, 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 I haven't read enough about, you know, Islam or Muslim community. Yeah, yeah, to know the than... nuances and how yeah, it works. Yeah, but now, 10 years on, well, it's, it's different. kind of like we can we can understand and present and more yeah, comfortably yeah, yeah. talking. Um, but the exhibition is about the Indian army. The Sikh stories have come through us. Yeah. But there, there are all the other communities are represented in there. Gurkhas will probably find it interesting to visit mm. because there's some rare postcards on their histories and their forefathers. In oh, that, they were all part of the regiment yeah, as well. Yeah. You know, and Punjabi Muslims. Oh my God, it's like 50% of it's Punjabi Muslim in right. like, um, Indian army camps. And they, anyone that was dressed in regal headgear, they were the ones who were photographed. So Sikhs were photographed disproportionately more because they had a higher, taller height, you know? That is the end of the Indian army at the Palace Exhibition podcast. With two of the community curators and organizers, Rav and Tejpal Singh. If you want to support the work I'm doing and see ramblings of a Sikh grow, then consider becoming a paid YouTube member or join our Patreon community via the links below. Your support helps us produce content but also provides you with exclusive features, including early access to all our videos. Your contribution helps bring these stories and videos to life, and for that, I'm deeply appreciative. Remember, there is a super exciting behind the scenes video of the exhibition coming out very soon, so don't forget to subscribe. Otherwise than that, I'll see you all in the next video.